Um, welcome to lecture 14 of CSE 548, The Analysis of Algorithms. Um, before we start, there are a couple of notes we just want to start off with for the people here. First of all, I've put a survey form in the back, um, in the back of the class, um, just a blank form for you to write some comments if you have any questions about how the, how the course is going, if you'd like to give me any feedback about things. I encourage you to fill out the for survey and put it back there. You can be as nasty as you want because no one will look at these except me. Okay, um, so so don't worry about that. Um, but hopefully you'll be instructive. It'll, what you'll put down will be constructive and not nasty. Um, a second thing is um, that we have Pizza with the Prof on Monday, next Monday at one o'clock. So if you haven't signed up for Pizza with the Prof yet, um, I encourage you to do so. We still have uh, several slots for that. Um, are there any questions about the programming assignment? Okay, let's start off. How are people doing on the programming assignment? Okay. How many people have programs now that, success, that, that correctly compute the backtrack, the, the, the bandwidth? Okay. How many people have started on programs that correctly compute the bandwidth? Okay. A few more. How many people have not started on anything at all? Okay. Uh, probably got split in equally into thirds. Okay. I encourage the people who haven't gotten started to get going on it. Um, what's the, the, the best program? How many people of the people who have working programs? What's the, what sizes are people able to do for graphs so far? Okay, so 15. 15 or so, okay. I've heard rumors of, of somebody who can do up to 30, okay? Yeah, 30. 30, okay. Any other ones? Okay. So the fastest we have so far now, an unsubstantiated rumor of up to 30, okay? But I expect people can do better than that if they, uh, they sit down and grind it out a little bit, okay? But now you know what you're sort of shooting for. 30, well, the, 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 there's a rumor of um, a program that's capable of solving instances up to size 30 vertices within about, you know, about the minute range. Okay? Um, you know, we'll see. I think, I think this class has people we can do better. Okay, but let's see what happens. Okay? Any questions about, come up about the program from people who started thinking about it? If you don't get up to 30, don't worry about it. Okay? But it's important to get something going. Yeah? Um, how many points will you get on the assignment? Okay. If it's correct, you get full credit. Um, if, if, if it's correct, you don't get full credit. But um, it, I, my, strong, the, my first concern is that people get something working, okay, even if it's slow. Okay? And then the second correct is to see that people will um, do, you know, do better. Okay? I mean, my, my, my rough idea, I don't, first, how will I grade these things? One idea I've done in the past, which I don't guarantee I'll do again, is I take the size of the largest instance people are able to solve take the log of that and then give that as the grade. Okay? So you figure out um, what that actually means. Okay? Right, yeah. Turn turn in a correct, right? The goal is to is to get something correct. Okay? And then once you've got something correct to then worry about trying to do pruning in a better way. Okay? I've posted um, to help people verify their programs, I've posted um, results on a lot of the data files. Okay, so uh, there, you know, sort of what the answer should be. So you can check your own programs on that. I might later give you a different set of data files to actually run your final version on, but, um, but I think that that will be enough to help you check your programs out, make sure that they're correct. Okay, again, if you haven't gotten something started, make sure you get a program that works correctly. If you have a program that works correctly, then the fun is to try to speed it up, okay, and um, you know, do the best you can. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Final thing is if you're a graduate student, um, uh, about a, you know, a week or so ago I started distributing the graduate project handouts. Okay, and so if you haven't spoken to me about what project to do, you should do it. Question. question. When you're comparing the best uh, programs, are you going to compare the entire class as a whole or separately as graduate? Okay, the grades on everything will be, will, there will be separate, as far as how, how will the programs be graded, there will be separate grad and undergrad. Um, you know, I, I separate all, on all the grades we have grad and undergrads. Okay, we will have a prize for the fastest program in both the graduate and undergraduate divisions. Okay, so, um, so, 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 so I encourage you, if you're an undergrad, don't be intimidated by rumors of fast programs if they come from graduate students. Okay, any other questions? Okay, very good. Okay, the problem of the day um, was talking about dynamic programming. And um, the dynamic programming problems, until you sort of get to understand where they come from or whatnot, it's a hard thing to do. I'm not going to tell you otherwise until you figure it out. 
I just wanted to quickly review sort of problem solving techniques. Okay, because this is what, what you should do when you're given one of these problems. Okay? The most important thing is to make sure you understand what the question is asking. Okay, if you don't understand, ever don't understand what a question is asking, you have no hope of solving it. Okay, and that's a fairly deep concept. Okay? That's true, you know, true in a lot of circumstances. Okay? Um, when you have a problem, the first thing that you should do is probably play around with constructing examples to get some idea as to what, what's interesting about the problem, why it works, and things like that. Okay? And um, basically to ask yourself questions is the biggest single thing in problem solving. Okay? That when you, you have your problem, you, you, you run through a list of questions. Why doesn't this work? What should I do next? Again, a few weeks ago, I went through a list of some of the questions I asked myself. Okay? And I'd encourage you to go refer to those notes to see, what, to see them. Okay? Again, to see what kind of questions maybe you should ask. And one important question you should ask is, are you using all the problem that information that you're given? Okay? Because usually, if you're given that information, there's a reason for it. Okay? Any questions about that? If you really get confused about problems, if you want to know more, there's a really fantastic book by Paglia called How to Solve It, okay, which is my standard recommendation to anyone who really has trouble with problem solving. Paglia was a, was a great mathematician, but, but more than that, he spent a lot of time trying to figure out what it is that people, how is it that people think, and how is it that people solve problems. And um, you know, the book that he has, I think, is, is, is the best guide I've seen. Okay? Any questions? So that said, let's look at a particular problem, the problem of the day, and to see how would we solve such a problem. Okay? The problem asks about, um, we're given to, we want to solve, you know, we, we want to solve a variation of the traveling salesman problem of points in the plane. Okay? Now, the problem, traveling salesman problem we've shown, we've talked about a lot, there's no fast algorithm known to find the optimal traveling salesman tour. Okay? But therefore, someone suggested, Bentley suggested, that one way you could find a fast algorithm for finding a tour, okay, not necessarily the best tour, okay, is to just think about tours that he calls bitonic. Okay, it says that is tours which start at the leftmost point, go strictly left to right to the rightmost point, and then go strictly back to the starting point. Uh, and in the book, they gave two figures like this. This, the claim was, was a um, bitonic tour, okay? Why? A non-bitonic tour, why? You start from the left, it goes to the right. From the right, it goes to the left, to the left, to the left. Oops, it goes to the right, okay? The thing that they're complaining here about um, whether it's bitonic or non-bitonic is the fact that here, if we split it between the left and right chains, the bottom chain doesn't go strictly to the, strictly to the left. Okay? This tour over here is a bitonic tour. Because on the top chain it goes to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. Then it goes to the left, to the left, to the left. That's what they mean by a bitonic tour. Okay? And the problem here is give an n squared algorithm to find the bitonic, optimal bitonic tour. Okay? And um, you may assume that no points contain the same x coordinate. Hint. Scan left to right, maintaining optimal possibilities for the two parts of the tour. Okay? Any questions about what the problem is? Okay? Or is that now kind of questions? Okay, by tonic means, let's just take a look at this thing. These are the same set of points we have. Okay? The tour is going to be in order to visit the points. Okay? Here, the tour is going. It says it strict goes, it says, the word it says, tours which start at the leftmost point go strictly left to right to the rightmost point and then go back, strictly right back to the starting point. Or so basically, we start off going to the right, 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 right. Then we go strictly to the left, 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 left. Okay, here was a non bitonic tour. They, they claim this is the best one possible, but it's not bitonic. Why? Because you go left, left, oops, you go to the right. Okay? So this, the best tour that might be non-bitonic is going to be better than the best tour that is bitonic, potentially. Okay? But the difference is that we can find the best bitonic tour in n squared time. Okay? And that was deemed easy enough that, that one could give it as a homework problem. Okay? So how do we do it? 
Okay, any questions first? Any further questions about the problem? Okay, why it exists or what it's doing? How do you solve it? Well, first thing you do, you make sure you understand it. Then you play around and you ask yourself, why is it, isn't it trivial or what's going on here? And so when I was playing around with it, these are the kind of things that I observed. Okay, you may observe other things when you're playing around with it. First thing to see is that the optimal Vitanic tour can go up and down a lot. Why? You could imagine having a bunch of points. Um, let's see, where did I put my pen here? You could have, you know, it could sort of the, you could imagine a set of points, let's say. Um, actually, let me get my, my um, markers. You could certainly imagine a set of points that look sort of like this. And when you ask for what's the bitonic tour for this, the optimal one is going to go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, something like that. So that shouldn't be a surprise. Okay. If you think about it, if you have a point in the middle, you can't automatically say, is that going to go on the top or the bottom chain? Okay. So any algorithm that decides, looks at the point and immediately says, are you going on the top or the bottom, can't work. That was one observation that I had. Or it wasn't obvious how you make that decision. Okay. Another thing to note is that you might have a long chain of points, consecutive points on the upper and you know, on, on one chain. It could be that the points as you scan from left to right, you put one on the top, one on the bottom, one at the top, one at the bottom. Or you could have arbitrarily long runs of points on, the, um, you know, on, on one consecutive chain if they happen to be very close together. Okay? So all of these things are certainly possible in a bitonic tour. And by playing around with these examples, I now understand this a lot better. Okay, any questions about any of my observations? Okay. This next question I'd ask, for example, is am I using all the information? Okay. They gave us some kind of a hint that, th that, that, that they'll let us assume that no two x coordinates are the same. What does that likely mean? Okay, if you, if you think about what that might mean. Okay. That means that if we order the points from left to right, there's a unique order in which they occur from left to right. Okay, So that's telling me, if you just want to play gamesmanship, the left to right order's got to mean something. Okay, And so that maybe the right way to think about this problem is scanning the points from left to right and doing something with them. Okay. So what happens when you scan things from left to right? Okay, If this was the optimal tour, Suppose you have a line that crosses this tour, sort of a, a line that's sweeping over the tour as it goes along. What is interesting about the fact that it's a bitonic tour? Okay. How many times is this line going to cut that tour as it sweeps from left to right? Okay. My claim is that, 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 that no matter where you cut it, it's only going to cut it in two pieces. Correct? There's an upper chain and a lower chain. If we turn the tour upside, you know, on a different side that isn't x, y, and we cut it, note that we might cut it in many places. Because of it's a bitonic tour, okay, or one of the interesting things about a bitonic tour is that we're only going to be cutting it, you know, at one, you know, basically, there's only going to be an upper and lower chain no matter where we cut it along this tour. Does everybody agree with that? As a result of the definition. We may not see well, where does it lead, may not be obvious. Okay. But what I claim is sort of this, this the hint here is that if we think about an optimal tour, as we sweep from left to right, there's going to be the kth point. If we sort of take a look at our sweep line here, okay, our kth point is going to be connected to exactly one point to the left of us. Which point is it going to be? Well, it could be the, the k minus first point, or it could be a lot of points between that. But somehow when we scan from left to right, that kth point is going to be connected to some point less than the k. Okay, That's sort of the key idea here. Okay, And now what I need is some way to figure out what that point is. What is the optimal point to connect the kth point to? Okay. 
And here's where I should start to think about a recurrence relation. What happens if I connect it to a particular point x? OK? What do I know about the tour not counting that? I'm now going to have a tour that ends, if, if I connect from the kth point to the xth point, I'm now going to have to ha take care of an optimal tour for the rest of the points. What do I know about that optimal tour? It's going to have to end in one side at the kth point and on the other side at the what point. OK? If this was the kth point, the k minus first point has to be connected to somebody. OK? It can either be connected to the kth point or it can define the other end of the other chain. And my claim of what my recurrence relation is going to come from, OK? Let me just get out of here. My idea of the recurrence relation is that I'm going to look for the optimal place to connect that kth point to. OK? I know at any given moment, I'm going to have to connect this point to somebody. Once I decide where to connect that guy to, all the other points on the left, if this is really the optimal tour, once I decide to insert an edge from, let's say, k to x, then I know that the optimal tour for the rest of the points has to have one side end at x and another side end basically at k minus 1. Okay, And so the idea here is that I'm going to break this into a recurrence relation where I'm going to let some function ck be the cost of the optimal partial tour where the two endpoints are going to be k and n. Okay? And my claim is if I knew what the cheapest tour that ends at k and n for all values of k and n, where k and n range from 1 to the number of points, which maybe I'll call big N, okay? That I claim will provide all the information I need to design an optimal tour. Okay? That's the way that I'm thinking about this. Okay, any questions come to mind? Okay? Okay? How would my recurrence relation look? Well, what's the optimal tour that ends at k and n? Okay? Well, I know that there's two possibilities. Okay? If I have a tour that ends at k and n, okay, here, let's say this is k, this is n. There's sort of are going to be two possibilities. Okay? Either the um, k and n are very close to each other. OK? Like they only differ by two points, k n minus 1. If k is equal to n minus 1 and n, then the x and y coordinates, and these are basically neighboring points in terms of the x ordering of those points. If that's true, then I know that one of the, there's going to exist some k, OK, such that the nth point OK, was connected to some value k, OK, and the n minus first point, and what's going to be left with, once I decide to match the nth point to that thing, I'm going to want to know what's the optimal cost of the remaining tour, which means to connect the n minus first point, the other, one, the other end, OK, find what's the cheapest tour that leaves that end point, so these are the two end points that I'd leave. If the last point connects to the kth point, and the two boundaries were n and n minus k, then I'm going to want to try to find the k that minimizes this quantity. OK? If that, OK, that's if the two end points of my partial tour happen to be neighbors of each other. 
OK, any questions so far? I'm sure there's a lot of confused faces. Yeah. You have the two point N. And why did you draw the line go somewhere forward to the left? I mean, you only have two places that you can connect to. Right? OK, what is, what, is, what is KN? What is CKN? OK, CKN is defined as being the optimal cost partial tour where the two endpoints are K and N. I want to now make what is the cheapest tour where the two endpoints are the nth point and the n minus first point. OK? Consider any tour where that happens. One endpoint is at the n minus first. Another endpoint is at the nth point. Correct? What is the nth point connected to? OK? In the optimal partial tour. It's connected to some point to the left of n, correct? Which point should it be? Whichever point's going to give me the cheapest possible tour, correct? Yes? Well, suppose I could magically be told if I connect it to some point k, what the cost of the cheapest tour that ends at k and n minus 1 is for any k. If I decide to connect this point to point what's the cheapest way to finish the job? Well, I want to know what's the cheapest way a tour is going to end at one point at k and another point at n minus 1. So if you could tell me that information, for every value k from 1 to n, then I could find the cheapest one. The total cost of my tour is going to be the cost of this edge to connect it, plus the cost of whatever was involved in the cheapest. So what do I say? The cost of the, the way to end from n to n minus 1 is less than or equal to, for any k, the cost of ending it from k to n minus 1 plus the cost of that actual edge. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to find the k that minimizes this. So I'm going to min over all k from 1 to n. And that will tell me how to fill this box. OK? If these two points are the two adjacent points in the x order, n has to be connected to somebody. That somebody's got to be the left. Okay? It's going to be some point k numbered from 1 to n. Let me try all possibilities and find the cheapest way to do it. Okay? Any other further questions about this? Okay? What is d? D is the distance from point k to point n, the actual Euclidean distance of that edge. OK? Any other questions? OK? Now, what if we had a picture that was a little bit different, where we had a big gap between, here we have the case of where n and n minus 1 are neighboring points. What about the case we want to know the cheapest tour that ends at k and and where there's several points between k and n. OK? If it ends at k and ends at n, if the two chains end there, what was point n minus 1 between k and n connected to? OK? It had to be connected to n minus 2, but more than that, n, this point had to be directly connected to n. Correct? If there's a big gap here, why couldn't this tour jump out, pick up that point, and come back? Because then it wouldn't be a bitonic tour. OK? We would have gone to the left and gone right on one chain. So if there's a big gap between these points, k and n, Yes? A big gap means some point in between it. OK, it's so a point whose, whose x coordinates are different. So if you, well, but suppose let's say that there's points in between. 
The indices are different. This is a case of the function of the indices, not the x distances. Suppose we have a case where we want to know what's the optimal tour that ends at k and k plus 5, let's say. OK? We know that since there's a difference between k and k plus 5 because there's five points in between. If we want to know the optimal tour between here and here, we know that we really want to know what's the optimal tour between k and this point minus 1. Because there isn't any choice now about connecting this thing. OK? So for that case, the case where there's a big gap, we have a simpler occurrence. The cost of connecting from, C to, from k to n is going to be the cost of connecting from k to n minus 1 plus the cost of that last link from the nth point to the one right before it. OK? So there's two different cases here. One where we've got a decision to make, which is when the two boundary points are close to each other. There's no intermediate points. And one where the decision is essentially made for us. In fact, it's completely made for us by the fact that we can't zigzag. OK? When you see that, again, this is a little bit complicated. I'm not going to tell you otherwise. OK? But you should see that what, that what you really need is the partial answers. Because we've got things ordered from left to right. There's partial answers here. Okay, that to tell us about the status of what the best way to do things further to the left is the key idea to figuring out what's the best way to do things, period. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, how many people sort of see what I'm doing here? Okay, how many people do not see what I'm doing? Okay, anyone want to ask a question about it? Okay, question. OK? So what is the time that it takes to compute this recurrence relation? I've got two kinds of recurrence cells. OK? What is the value that the, the, if I have n points, big n points, what is the value of the left coordinate going to range from? OK? Where is the end of the top chain going to be? Somewhere between 1 and big n. What's the value of the bottom chain going to be? That endpoint will be somewhere between 1 and big N. So they're all told there's N squared cells to be filled in that are interesting here. N squared values of CKN. OK? How much time does it take to fill each cell? Well, this cell is easy to fill. Whenever there's a big difference between the two indices, we don't have to do any work. We look something up in a box and, re and compute a Euclidean distance between two points. So for any cell where they differ by more than one, the indices differ by more than one, that cell takes constant time to fill. Correct? OK. That's just a question of reading the recurrence and not believing it. How much time does it take to fill a cell where they're neighboring elements? Well, we're going to have to min over all possible values of that connecting point. So it'll take order n time to fill that cell. OK? And so what we've got here are n squared cells, order n squared cells that require constant time to update each. And it turns out only n cells that require linear time to update. So what's the total time that we're going to fill in? There's n cells which diff of the form i comma i plus 1, because i is going to range from 1 to n. So n cells times n takes n squared time. The remaining n squared minus n cells take constant time each. n squared times 1 plus n times n is n squared. And so the total time to fill in all the boxes is order n squared. OK? Any questions? OK? Question. 
Okay, what? Okay, that's a good question. Suppose I look at a particular box in this matrix. Here's n and here's k. Here in this particular box, this is kn equals, let's maybe zoom this baby in. Here n is 3, k is 1. Big difference between the two bounds, intermediate point, right? We've now, that means that we find the optimal tour. Here is the third point. Here is the second point. Here is the first point. We want to figure out what's the optimal tour where one endpoint is here and the other endpoint is there. That had to pick up this point. So that was going to be this cell involved in the matrix, correct? And this was just going to take constant time to fill because the only thing we needed was kn minus 1, which meant that we needed that cell to be ready, correct? That's exactly which cell it is, k, n minus 1. Suppose we now consider this case where they differ by 1 here. Let's say we have um, n3 equals 2. OK, k equals 3, n equals 10 equals 2, n equals 3. They differ by 1. We're going to want to look at all intermediate values. OK, we have this case situation. Look at all intermediate values between 1 and 3, maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.0, 0 0.2, as possible intermediaries. The values we're going to need for the recurrence to compute this thing are C of k n minus 1, n is going to be 2, k is going to be anything before it. That means that we're going to be looking at the cells in this row. If we fill the cells in, in order like this, every cell we need is either to the left of us or is basically to the left of us. If we fill in the cells from left to right up to down, every cell we need is sitting there waiting for us when we need it. So we can just look up that quantity. Okay, It's there for us to grab. Okay, So that's why we know that this is going to work. The key point to seeing that is, look, the difference between these two is n minus k. On all the right sides, the gaps are much smaller. We've reduced the sizes of the gaps. That means that we fill them in with the smallest gaps first, and then slowly try bigger and bigger gaps. Okay, And it's got to be ready there Okay, if we do so. Question? We're looking for the combination of the edge with the minimum path, which will permit us to have a minimum path to finish the job up. Just picking that edge in isolation is wrong. We want to just pick the smallest edge. We want to pick the smallest edge that will give us the best possibilities. What we need to know is we need to have described our problem, the solution to our problem, in terms of previous values of the problem. So when you say, the reason why I'm bulking is you're talking about concerned about the minimum edge. I want to know that the cost of finding the optimal tour that ends at these two points as a function of the optimal tour that ends at two earlier points and the cost of finishing the job up by adding that extra edge. That's what I want to do. Okay, I want to think of how do I think at my current answer in terms of a previous answer to a smaller problem, and then do the adjustments. Okay, this is not an easy one. I won't. I won't tell you that thing. The other thing that that, that once you see this again, I urge you to think about this example some more. Okay. This is actually going to give us not a, 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 a closed tour, but the optimal open tours that end at every possible point. In fact, we were originally interested in a closed tour. So eventually, we're going to have to connect the end. 
Okay? So the real answer that we're going to be interested in is minimizing over all valley intermediate points the cost of the open tour that ends at, at K and N and the cost of actually connecting that, those two open points together, okay? namely the distance from K to N. So there's a final, once we have this matrix, this matrix is computing open tours. We eventually have to close it up, but that can be done in linear time, given this, once we have it. OK, any questions? OK, again, some, some people I can how many people think they're sort of getting it? Not too many, I suspect, OK? How many people don't think they're getting it? OK, that's fair to say. Let's try. We'll try some other examples that are actually going to be a little simpler than this, just to make sure that people get their hands on it. Okay? But the key idea, the idea, I mean, there's two issues with the dynamic programming. One issue is an issue of correctness. Why is this going to give us the correct tour? Okay? Why does this give us the absolute best answer? And the reason behind it okay, is because of something called the principle of optimality, which is one of these sort of vague ideas. OK? But basically what it says is that if our, our problem has the principle of optimality, if once we make a decision about something, OK, the best tour, OK, okay that, 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 that contains that decision means that we make all other decisions optimal with regard to the current state from that condition. So what are we saying? In the case of the bitonic tour situation, whenever we decided to add an edge between two points, from let's say the kth end point to the kth point, if we're going to have this edge in a tour, that means that we're going to have a bitonic tour that ends that 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 the leading that, that there's going to be a tour that ends in k and n. OK, that's obviously true. But what we're saying is if we want to think of what's the optimal tour that contains this edge, my claim is it has to be the cheapest tour that goes from here to here. OK? What we want to say is somehow that the solution to the global problem, the global problem is all these points. Okay? What the principle of optimality says that once we make a decision to add that edge, the optimal solution to everything means the optimal solution find of the subproblem. Okay? Why does that make sense? If you want the best tour that ends at n and n minus 1, and you add this edge, is there any reason why the global sh the shortest tour would not contain the best possible way of finishing this job? Suppose there was a way to f do an endpoints that end at to, to do a partial tour that ends at k and n minus one, which cost fifty, and another way that cost a hundred. Once you've decided to use this edge. Is there any possible reason why you're going to want the more expensive way to finish the job instead of the cheaper way? Maybe if you're a contractor, but not if you're trying to find the cheapest cost tour. Once you make, the point point was that once you make a decision, if you're going to use this particular component, the cheapest way to finish the entire job, we've reduced to the cheapest way to finish this subproblem. Some problems have that property. Some problems don't. OK? The ones that do are the ones we can apply dynamic programming to. OK? That's sort of what the idea here is. In a problem like this, we, and, and the basic point is that we know that when we add this thing, OK, that this isn't going to interfere with anything. Okay, that it's always going to pay to take the cheaper of the two possibilities. Okay? That's what sort of the idea here is. Any questions? Okay? 
So one reason why dynamic programming works is because we have this principle here, that we can get the optimal answer based on smaller optimal answers. The other thing that, that, that reason why dynamic programming works is when we have a situation where we're not going to have to store too many partial solutions to make it practical. Okay? Let's think of the general traveling salesman problem. Okay? In general, with the traveling salesman problem, you've got n points. You want to find the cheapest tour to visit all of those points. Okay? We could try to solve, dynamic, to solve this problem using dynamic programming by storing all partial subtours. For example, the following recurrence will correctly solve any dynamic, will, will correctly solve any traveling salesman problem. Okay? What is the recurrence? It's T of I colon J through K would have let denote the cost of the optimal tour, okay? from i to 1 that goes through each of these cities once. OK? This is a complicated recurrence. OK? But here we're going to say we're going to let t sub i j denote the cost of the optimal tour from i to 1 that goes through each of the other argumented cities once. OK? The claim would be that you can make a recurrence out of this. The cost of the optimal way to go from I through all these cities is going to be the cost of actually going from a city I to some city J sub M. We know that we have to go from the I city is going to have to go to somebody. And then we're going to want to figure out the smallest tour that goes from J sub M, the point we connect it to, to all the points getting back to 1. So if we minimize this over all possible choices of this extra city, okay, we could have a recurrence relation which will correctly solve the TSP problem. Okay? If you think about it a little bit more, it'll, it'll, it'll be clear. But that's not so important. The important thing is to see that it can't be very efficient. Because here, the number of arguments we have, okay, we talk about passing through all of these cities. Okay? There's n different arguments here, potentially. And each of these arguments is going to be a city name. There's lots of different possibilities. There's an exponential number of possible cases that you have to store. And if you believe that, then this is not going to be an effective strategy. The reasons when we can, times when we can apply dynamic programming are exactly the times when there's not too many different solutions. OK? Any questions about that? That may have been vague. OK? But this is sort of the, the, the take home lesson that you should remember. Dynamic programming is computing recurrence relations by storing results. The only time it can be efficient is when there's not that many possibilities. OK? Partial results that are interesting. If you say you want to compute the TSP tour or the bandwidth, well, there's n factorial permutations. If you compute all possible sub-permutations, it's exponential. You lose. Can't do it. OK? If you try to compute it over all subsets, you can't do it. There's 2 to the n subsets. It's exponential. You lose. However, notice that when we talk about a string of characters, where characters are ordered from left to right, If the order is fixed, and we want to now try all possible substrings, consecutive substrings, each substring is defined by a left point and a right point. A left point and a right point. There's only n possible choices for the left point, n possible choices for the right point. So if we want to reduce our problem to solutions where the, um, where, we, where our answers are in terms of starting and stopping points. There's only n squared of them, and that's going to be good. Okay? If we have a problem where we have an ordered trees, where the keys in the tree are ordered from left to right, okay? 
Again, there's only n possible choices of starting spots, n po possible choices of stopping spots. Again, n squared possibilities for particular contiguous subtree chunks. So dynamic programming can work on trying to figure out optimal search trees. If you have polygons, a chain of polygons, you've got a set of points, there's runs of them, there's an order to them. Each subchain is a start and stop. There's n squared of them. Dynamic programming will work on objects where there is a linear order that can't be rearranged. That's the take home lesson. Okay? Whenever you have an optimization problem on something like matrices in a chain, remember we couldn't rearrange the matrices. We could just sort of take them in different clumps of consecutive runs. Okay? When we were doing edit distance, we couldn't move the characters around wildly. We could only take consecutive chunks of things and match them to consecutive chunks of things. Okay? So they were linearly ordered. When we talk about points on a polygon, they're linearly ordered by the order of the tour. On these things, we can use dynamic programming. Okay? And the thing for you to remember is whenever you've got an optimization problem, where your objects have a left-right order to them, almost certainly you can use dynamic programming once you understand how to do it. Okay? And when you look at enough examples, it'll eventually become clear. Okay, any questions? Okay. Let's look at another example of applying dynamic programming. Okay, this one a little simpler than the one we showed before. Suppose, let's say, we have a polygon, OK? This is a polygon, this boundary thing here. We call a triangulation of a polygon, OK, a, when, we, when we insert diagonals into the polygon to divide it so that every face that we see is a triangle, OK? So for example, here, by inserting these diagonals, OK? This space is a triangle, triangle, triangle. Everything we have here is a triangle. There's more than one way to triangulate a polygon, OK, as you can see. Here, for example, is a different way. Every face is still a, tri is still a triangle, but it looks quite a bit different than that, OK? Turns out in a lot of different applications, Whatever you're doing, in fact, almost any geometric algorithm, when you're given us a, a polygon, one of the first things you want to do is to break it into triangles, because triangles are simple things. If you want to feed it to a graphics engine to render it, graphics programs know how to draw triangles. Okay? So you have to triangulate it before you give it to them. Okay? And in certain cases, you're interested in particular triangles, triangulations. Here you've got two different ways to do it. Sometimes you want to know what the best way to do it is. And one idea of best would be to try to find the one that minimizes the length of the edges you're adding. Let's say that you had a polygonal shaped room and you wanted to divide it up into triangular shaped rooms to rent out. And you have to pay, pay to actually, when you build a wall, the, kind of, the, the amount of material it costs is proportional to how long the wall is. So suppose, let's say, you were given the job of trying to figure out how to add walls to split into triangles, but using the minimum amount of material. We would be interested, then, in the triangulation whose sum of diagonals is minimized. OK? Any questions about what the problem is? OK, about what a triangulation is? Or how many people see what a triangulation is? OK, everybody. How many people believe you might want to find the one that has the smallest interior edges. OK, everybody accepts that. That said, how do you do it? Suppose we have a polygon, OK, which is convex, meaning nicely behaved so that every point sees every other point. How can we find the smallest triangulation, the triangulation with the smallest total edge length that we put into it? OK. Because it's a polygon, the points are ordered around the boundary of the polygon. Ordering is what we need to apply dynamic programming. 
What would we like to do? We'd like to reduce our problem of finding the optimal, the minimum length polygon triangulation over all things, the whole polygon, to a smaller problem. So how can we do that? Suppose I have an edge in my polygon. In any triangulation, this edge is going to be involved with one triangle. Correct? Take a look up here. This edge here is involved with one triangle. This boundary edge here is involved with one triangle. In order to define that triangle, it's going to, you've got two endpoints. There's going to have to be a third endpoint, correct? Which endpoint should we connect it to if we want the smallest possible triangulation? Do we connect it to this point? Or do we connect it to that point? We don't know, but we connect it to some point. Which point do we want to connect it to? The one that will give us the best order, total size. Once we decide to connect it to some point, what's the price we pay for doing so? Well, we have to build these two walls, correct? Now this guy's a triangle. What's left to be triangulated if we do this? OK? You've still got a polygon here. And you've still got a polygon here that you want to try to figure out how to finish it up. Correct? If we decide that this is the edge that we want to connect it to, is there any reason why we're not going to want to know the cheapest possible way to finish up that job? Is there any reason why we'd want a more expensive than optimal way to triangulate this last part? Or would we want the smallest way? Of course. We've reduced our problem of finding the best way to do it for the big polygon to the cost of trying to find what the best next point is and then optimize smaller polygons. OK? My claim is that the way we do that is we have a recurrence relation like this. What is the cost? The cost of the optimal triangulation from vertex i to vertex j is we minimize over all possible choices for a point j that's between them. And the cost of doing this is the cost of adding these two edges, OK, plus the cost of finishing the triangulation if we connect to the jth point. Okay, you know, we connect, excuse me, we're going from the ith point to the jth point. We're going to try to find all possible intermediate points k. For each one, if we choose to do it, we're going to have a problem of connecting from point i to k, the optimal way of doing that for some problem, the optimal way of doing from k to j, that subproblem plus the cost of the two edges that we added. OK? We, could, which, we don't know which point we want, but we know it's got to be connected to some point. Once we connect it to some point, that answer depends upon the answers to two smaller problems. So by storing the smaller problems, those answers are there when we need them. OK? And we pull out the one that simply that, that does the job. OK, any questions? Yes? Take the minimum of everything. OK, that's the point here. We know that, I mean, it's just pretty much by definition. We want the cheapest possible triangulation that ends with i and j. If we have this edge that has this edge, that edge is on the boundary, it's got to be connected to somebody. The one we want it to is the one that's going to give us the absolute cheapest cost. It's got to be some point. Which point is it? Well, what's the cost if we do it? We got to build this wall, build that wall, finish the job, finish the job. 
And so we simply take the minimum of all possible choices and compute what the cost would be of doing it that way. And we just take the best bid. That's the minimum of that. OK, any questions about that? Yes? Well, you say one large triangle. What do you mean by large triangle? Uh, in, the, uh, in the example you gave, right, yes. there's like one triangle which used the base of the polygon and the middle point. OK, any solution, there's any tri thing that completely triangulates this polygon is going to have to have a triangle with this edge. Why? Suppose it didn't. Is this a triangle here? So how are we going to make it a triangle without touching this edge in one way or another? OK? This face is going to have to be connected to somebody. There's nothing special about being on the bottom face. For every face is going to have to be involved in a triangle with every edge on the boundary will have to be involved with somebody. The involvement with somebody means identifying which vertex is it connected to. OK? We're trying over all possibilities and picking the one that does the cheapest job. That's why this has to be correct. OK? Because we've taken our global problem and reduced it to two smaller problems, which are independent. Maybe. The two smaller subproblems are going to be such that this problem is very small, meaning that, 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 that k equals i plus 1, and this problem is very large in terms of the number of points. Or maybe it's going to be the case that they're equally split, that k is going to be even between i and j. Or maybe k is going to be equal to j. I don't know, and I don't care, but I don't have to care. Because I'm minimizing over all possibilities. I have to get the right one. OK? Any questions about that? How many people sort of see this example, why it works? OK? How many people are still confused with it? OK? Question. OK, how much time does this take now? The first thing you do is you get a recurrence that works. We now know that this is correct. How much time does it take? OK? What I do is I say, how many boxes are there? How many boxes are there going to be if we have an n vertex polygon? OK? How do we describe each box? What's the first thing? The first thing is a vertex from 1 to n. The second thing is a vertex from 1 to n. There's n squared boxes. OK? Does everybody agree with that? How much time does it take to fill in a box? What do we do in this recurrence? We're minimizing over all values of k between this thing. K could be as large, the, the difference between them could be as large as n. Correct? I mean, you know, it's the difference from j minus i. Rounding up, it's going to be at most, the difference between the, 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 the number of points between the, the i and j could be as much as n. How much work do we do? We look it up in a table, one. Look it up in a table, one. Compute the distance between two points, one. Compute the distance between two points, one. One and one and one and one is one. OK? Order one times order n is order n. n squared time per box. n squared box, what's the total time it takes? n cubed. OK? That's how you go and work these things out. The time analysis, when you be core, you know, be, don't, don't get too cute about how you analyze this thing. Take the biggest gap per cell and then multiply that by the number of cells. And that will clearly give you an upper bound. And almost always that will be the right upper bound. Okay? If not, you analyze a little closely because maybe, maybe some cells are a lot more expensive than others. Okay? But that's where this comes from. And that's why it works. Okay, any questions about minimum length triangulations? Okay, very good.
I'd like to talk about two other, and this is an important example to understand, just because it's a, a relatively simple example that we've worked out the thing completely. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to continue with this. Yes? Um, on a normal today's machine, if you have whatever, a, a big data set with millions of vertices, how long would such a triangulation take? So you want to say, how, the question was sort of, an n-cubed algorithm, how much time will it take on a machine? How, how much time does an n-cubed thing take? OK. Well, how would I figure this thing out? OK, I mean, roughly. It depends rough, a little bit on your machine. But let's get an order of magnitude estimate. I say a computer can do a million things a second, correct? Well, roughly that. If you want to say it's 10 million things or a billion things, I don't care. OK, it's not important. It's about a million things a second. Okay. Actually, that's probably less than that, right? It's more like a, about a million things per second, OK? So we want to know that the time it's going to take is if I have, let's say I have something of size 100. What's 100 cubed? 100 times 100 times 100. What? 100 cubed is 100. I don't, OK, I don't know. 100 times two zeros. That will square it. Times two more zeros, right? OK. So something of size n equals 100 is about a second. You say, well, wait, maybe it's 10 seconds. OK, maybe it's 10 seconds. Maybe it's a tenth of a second. OK? So something of size 100 you can do without having to fetch a cup of coffee. OK? Now, what, you know, but something of size 1,000, OK? If we add 1,000 times 1,000 times 1,000, Now you've got to fetch more than dinner, OK? <laughs> so that gives you a rough idea where it is, OK? That's how I would figure that out, OK? Any other questions? So n cubed is an expensive algorithm, for, but compared to n square, n log n. But you, know, you can do it for some things, OK? Any questions? OK. I'd like to talk about two applications of dynamic programming in the real world. I mean, there are a couple of reasons why dynamic programming is a hard thing to learn. One reason is because the problems that it applies to best require a certain amount of explanation. They're embedded in things. Okay? But once you see that, the basic principle is that when you apply it to ordered objects, whenever you don't have to rearrange the objects to find the, the best thing, it's going to give you the optimal solution. So one day, I was taking a tour at Symbol Technology, which you know is a Long Island company that's a leader in barcodes. Okay? They have built a um, barcode symbology called PDF 417, which is a, a two-dimensional way of build, of a two-dimensional barcode designed to store more information than what you see on the box of cereal in the morning. Here, so a label like this can store the Gettysburg Address, which is several hundred characters instead of the 10-digit code number that's on the box of cereal. Okay? So they had developed this. This is a lot of technology. And in fact, a lot of the work for this was done in the computer science department at Stony Brook, some of the coding theory and things like that. Well, now that you can store a lot of text, they figured they needed a data compression method in order to, um, in order to um, make maximum use of this thing. And what they observed is, let's say, that when you were trying to use um, English text, if you were transmitting English text, most of the time, if the previous thing you had was a lowercase letter, most of the time, the next thing you have is going to be a lowercase letter. Correct? You know? Um, Skeena, K-I-E-N-A. OK? So they had the idea that they were going to transmit things, compress things by storing, by keeping track of a mode. The current state of the, the, of, of the reader could be in one of four different modes. It could be expecting the next thing to be a, data, a lowercase character, or it could have been expecting it to be a, an, an uppercase capital letter, or maybe something mixed, or maybe it was expecting it to be a punctuation symbol. And so they had designed the scheme where, again, this is exactly what they did. Okay. They had in their code specifications a table which said that for each possible mode, okay, be alpha mode, lower mode, mixed or punctuation mode, 
They were a set of characters you could transmit in that, represent in that mode. For example, the alphabets were all the capital ones. Okay? The lower ones, you know about the lower ones. The mixed, well, you had numbers and you had all kinds of other things. So what they did was as follows. They tried to represent each document by, you would be in a particular mode, you could specify the code for that character in that mode, or if let's say you were in this mode and you wanted a lowercase o, you could say, go to another mode, and then give them that lowercase o. OK? And the idea was that since you're spending a lot of time in each mode, you're probably not going to have to, you're not going to change modes too often. So you spend less time, you, you can spend, use less bits per character, OK? Enough less bits per character to overcome the cost of changing modes. That was their idea. OK? How many people understand the basic idea? OK, good. Anybody who's confused want to ask a question? But the basic idea. OK? So what they had was all these mode switches. And for each mode, you could either go, depending upon the mode, have a latch command, which would permanently, which would um, permanently put you into another mode. Or you could have a shift command which would temporarily put you in that mode. So for example, if you're writing an English sentence and you want to have a period, quite likely you're only going to want to shift into that mode, get the period, and come back. So if you have a shift command, one command to change mode, that character, and then go, automatically go back. Latch, you stay in that mode. So if it was just a latch, you would have to pay the cost of latching to here, put out that one character, and then latching back. It would cost you twice as much latching. OK? The question that we wanted to know, what they wanted to know was, or they, they, what they were doing was, saying, well, how do I decide when do I issue a shift command and when do I issue a latch command? OK? And you may say, well, it depends upon how long you're going to be there. OK? So they said, well, if I'm going to be in there a long time, I'll use a latch. Otherwise, I'll use a shift. And they just did this in a greedy, ad hoc way. I said, why don't we figure out what the cheapest possible way to encode your message is over all possible ways to encode it? Because I know that at any given moment in time, the best thing, the, the state of the situation is you're going to be at a particular point in the text, and you're going to be in one of the four possible modes. What are your possible actions from this point? You could either shift into another mode, or latch into another mode, or take the next character and encode it in your mode. There are all these possibilities. But in all cases, the state of the world to the left of you, once you issue a command, you're in a particular mode, and you're at a particular point in the text. The mode and the text together and the text position, once you've decided to be in this point at this time, there's an optimal way to get there. And, at the, and, and you can compute that from knowing what was the optimal way to get into all possible modes from all previous points in the text. OK? Again, the details, you have to see sort of the details of their latching. But it should be believable that this is how you would solve it. Because at any given point in the text, if you take a look at the optimal message, this is the optimal message. At some point, any point in this thing, I'm going to be in a mode. This is the optimal message. I'll be in a mode, and I will be at a certain point in my message. Once I decide to be in this position, I'm going to want to know what was the best possible way to get me in that mode to that point in text which pushes me further to the left. So when they told me they were doing greedy method, I said, you can use dynamic programming. Okay? And sure enough, they were arguing for a while. They were engineers. They didn't want to do dynamic programming. So we wrote it up. And what we were able to do was compress the cost of their message, incessantly increase their um, capacity of their barcodes by about 8%. 
by doing the dynamic programming algorithm instead of what they were doing. They were spending a lot of time building their scanners and stuff like that to, to get as much real estate as they can. But by using their code optimally, we got them an average of 8% on like 13,000 messages they tried it on. Okay? And it should have been obvious that dynamic programming was the answer. Because once you know the mode and the text, you know what the best way to do it is. It sort of has to be the best way to do everything to the left. Okay, question. Uh, yeah, why do they use fixed length encoding? Why do they use this? There's various reasons why they use this, that why they designed the scheme in the first place that depend a, a little bit upon the error correction properties of their codes. There's a reason why they do it, but it's complicated. Okay, it's, 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 it's good reasons. Okay, but it's complicated. Any other questions? Question. This algorithm will work for any kind of text given their certain mode switching commands and the way they've assigned their labels. Uh, if you do too much switching, okay, yes, you're in a bad set situation. But you want to make sure that, let's say, you want to make sure you're in the right mode at all times. Okay? You don't want to get fooled into being in a local, in, in the wrong modes, which you can be. And obviously you can be because they were fooled to the tune of 8% over what they thought was a good solution. Okay? So we were able to improve that by doing that. Any questions about that? Okay? Another problem that walked into my door, okay, at one point, was that there were some graduate students in computer graphics, okay, who were working here, who came to me, they said they want to do morphing. What is morphing? Well, they said that morphing is you want to be able to convert one image to another image in a way that it's smooth. So if you want to turn me into Frankenstein, in between you want me to look half like Frankenstein and half like me. Okay? How do you do it? Okay? Well, the key idea, or one of the key properties in the morphing, is you have to establish a correspondence between things. Correct? If you want to morph me into Frankenstein, you want my ears to be morphed into Frankenstein's ears. It'd look pretty bad if my ear suddenly got morphed into Frankenstein's nose. Okay, you know, it'd be sort of getting rearranged. So they came to me and said, look, how do we do this, this, this correspondence? Okay, I mean, we can reduce the problem so on each line, we have the set of pixels in our initial image and the set of pixels in our subsequent image. Okay, and we want to try to figure out how do we match these things up so there's not that much change between. So they're matched up in a natural way. So you match them up in a natural way. What do you mean by a natural way? Well, we want each interval to get matched to a roughly the same sized interval. And if it's a good thing, if you have two intervals that are both together about the same size and they're next to each other, maybe they'll get morphed to the big one. Try to figure out what was the best possible correspondence between these and those. OK, that's what they came by with, to me with. And I said, well, you're going to have to define to me what best is. But you're going to want to use dynamic programming. Why? Well, look, you've got two different intervals. You're never going to want to match this thing to that thing. OK? So the order, the relative order is being preserved. OK? Meaning that we want to know if we decide to match this guy to that. We want the optimal way of doing matching everything to the left of us. Correct? If we once we decide to match this guy to that guy, the problem is we would pay a cost for that and the cost of doing all the alignments to the left. This should sound just like the string edited distance, or a lot like the string editing problem. We want to edit these rows into that rows. Okay. And if we do it that way. The um, basic operations are instead of doing um, well, instead of doing sort of insertion or deletion or substitution, we do uh, match. Do we match a full set of runs? Do we merge runs? Do we split runs? Okay. Does anybody see that this problem really should sound like the approximate edit distance problem? And because we've got pixels and the pixels are ordered, it has to be something you've got to smell the dynamic programming to figure out the best way to do it. Okay? Then we got to get work with them to figure out what the, um, exactly what the cost should be. 
How much do you pay for a split? How much do you pay for a merge? Okay. How well does it work? Well, they didn't morph me into Frankenstein, but they did morph a lobster into a man using this kind of an idea. And so you can see that somehow they found the correspondence. This was the man, that's the lobster, and this is what happened in between. This is presumably half man, half lobster, something like that. <laughs> okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Again, once you un again, this may be still a little hazy. Once you understand the technique, it becomes very obvious. Okay, what it is. Okay, that these things apply. Okay, and that's why there's going to. That's why I urge you to go through these sections carefully, because once you know dynamic programming and understand it, then the, you know, you can somehow pull these magic algorithms out of the air. Okay, and it works well. Any questions about this? Okay. That said, um, any questions about the homework or anything like that? Rather than start the next chapter, why don't I call it a day, and we'll, we'll start talking about graphs next class. OK, thank you.